Hello everyone, it is WeC here, and today I'm announcing the release of Anvil Editor 1.1, the Definitive Edition. I say Definitive Edition because I intend for this to be the last major update to the mod, and hopefully the last one period, assuming that I ironed out all the bugs. Speaking of which, I need to apologize for leaving the Anvil game types themselves in the condition that I left them in after the release of 1.05. A big part of it is my fault for not properly testing each and every game type. I only tested a few of them and assumed that the rest would work all the same. Part of it too was also the fact that the version of RVT I was using had a major bug where if you didn't declare a network priority, it would accidentally declare an invalid one when compiling automatically. Invalid network priorities are very difficult to bug fix because for one, I didn't even know what the symptoms were until many months later and two, they can cause random inconsistencies for different clients, making it difficult to pin down exactly what the issue is. Now, I would have gone ahead and fixed this the moment I figured it out, but unfortunately by that point, I had finished college and started my career job, so I've had much less time on my hands as of late. With that said, the update is out now, so go ahead and download it if you haven't already. In this video, I intend on going over all the new and changed features with Anvil Editor 1.1, but on top of that, later in the video, I'm going to go over and talk about every feature in the mod so that you don't have to watch the other two videos in order to do so, especially since some of the data in those videos is outdated by now. Those videos are going to remain up, but much like with Vengeful of Adam's Halo Reach Evolved video, I'm going to put a disclaimer that the information is outdated. Alongside talking about the new features and changed features in this update, I also want to talk about some things that are being released alongside this update. First of all is a script file containing all the Anvil game type features properly organized. These can be used to add to your own game types as you wish. Each feature has its own aliases, variable declarations, and so on. So copying them all at once will cause some duplicate declarations, but you just have to delete or comment those out and the code will compile. On top of that, you can change out the variables through the aliases, so you don't have to change them out throughout the whole script. And you would do this in order to avoid any variable conflicts. The other thing is a blank forge game type with my tick machine from Anvil Editor added to it. This will let you create your own forge game types without having to worry about the tick machine. All of these extra downloads are included in links below, which include the Anvil website and the Nexus Mods page. With all that said, allow me to talk about the changes and additions made to Anvil Editor 1.1. Starting with scale, I fixed issues where scale wouldn't show up properly for several game types. Now, scale should show up properly in every game type. I've updated the Shadowcaster feature once again. By default, a heavy barrier is used, and if one is not available on the map, then a monitor is used. A Warthog turret is no longer used at all, due to the fact that it messes with player interaction prompts for picking up weapons, gaining vehicles, and so on. I also updated scales so that by default, regular scaled objects are no longer made into scripted objects, meaning there's no limit to the number of them you can use on your maps. Do keep in mind that scale zones, that being hill marker with the scale label, as well as any scale objects with the Shadowcaster option enabled, will still create scripted objects. However, MCC itself updated this scripted object limit from 256 objects to 512, meaning that it's much less likely it'll hit the limit in Forge either way. I've also made it so that any object on the yellow team is immune to scale zones. For attach base and attachment, I updated the attachment label to attach with an offset depending on what team the attachment is on. On screen are all the attachment offsets, with neutral team remaining as no offset. I've also updated the custom turret attachments for the attachment label, so now any custom turret will properly attach to the base and be seen by all players when firing. For the spawner label, I added a bunch of additional options based on user feedback. The full list is in the description below with the updated documentation. But to simplify, the new spawner additions include fire, lights, some additional map objects for specific maps, and so on. 
for the Invasion game type specifically, I made some major updates to it. Back when I first released Anvil Editor, the Invasion game type was pretty much half-assed, because I frankly thought that people wouldn't use it since there were much better options out there. This was a really stupid decision on my part, and so I've gone ahead and rectified it. Now, Anvil Invasion has all the features the other game types have, but there is one caveat. I had to condense a number of game type labels down, which requires reforging the map a bit. With that said, barring these changes, the stock invasion maps and other vanilla invasion maps should work with Anvil Invasion. The first change is that I've condensed Invasion Vehicle into the Invasion Weapon label. So, you'll need to change all the vehicles from Invasion Vehicle to Invasion Weapon. The spawn sequences are exactly the same, however. Secondly, I've merged the Invasion No Core label into the Invasion Objective Flag label. Essentially, if you give the Invasion Objective Flag label a negative spawn sequence, it'll function as a No Core zone. Finally, I've condensed the Invasion Respawn zones for the individual phases into the Invasion Respawn Zone label. Positive spawn sequences operate the individual phases, with each phase getting four spawn sequences, one for each of the three fire teams, and one for all fire teams. The Invasion Respawn Zone's normal functionality, which is to appear and stay on when it reaches a certain phase, is now dedicated to the negative spawn sequences. So negative one is phase one onward, negative two is phase two onward, and negative three is just phase three. Mind you, this zone operates for all fire teams. There's also the none label, which for stock invasion maps is used exclusively for weapons and vehicles that you don't want to appear in invasion. And there's also the invasion cinematic and invasion platform labels. These two labels also appear in other game types, and they're used to spawn certain objects that otherwise only spawn for the map specific invasion variants. Namely, animation devices on breakpoint. Other than that, these three labels don't do anything, and using them on forge objects is meaningless. Now, let's talk about map objects for a moment. If you'll recall, Object by Index was made to be able to forge map objects and do with them as you please. Unfortunately, I couldn't get it to work consistently within the game types, and I was going to do so for 1.1. However, instead of making them work, I found out that Object by Index is never going to work as I want it to, and so I had to replace it. The replacement for this is Object Teleport. Object Teleport bypasses some of the issues I was having getting the clients and hosts to agree on which object was being targeted, which is one of the chief reasons why Object by Index wasn't working properly. Object Teleport requires two objects to function, one with a negative spawn sequence that is the sender node. You want to encase the map objects you want to teleport in this object's shape. The second is the receiver node, which has the same absolute spawn sequence but on the positive side. This is where the objects will get teleported to, and they do copy the orientation from the receiver node. In Forge, object teleport center nodes are off by default, but they can be turned on by hitting a switch or by saying the team to purple or yellow team. However, in custom games, they are always active, so you have to be careful you place them down. Additionally, setting the team to pink or yellow will make the map objects invincible. Setting the receiver to red team will detach the map object as soon as it's attached, and setting it to green team will activate Shadowcaster with map objects. Spawn Sequence 0 is a special case, and will attach the skybox to the base object, no sender or receiver node required. All the same properties of the receiver node still apply, so you can detach the skybox or make it a shadow caster if you desire. Within the Forge game type itself, I also made several changes. First of all, I updated Toolbar mode to have three sections. The toolbar section is the first section loaded in when the toolbar mode is activated, and it's a way to access the other two sections, object and player sections, as well as having a couple of switches of its own to control the toolbar and to control whether or not scripts will automatically go off at the beginning of a round. 
With the replacement of object by index with object teleport, the OBI attach switch has been replaced with a map OBJ teleport switch, which will activate the object teleport objects, unless they're on purple or yellow team, in which case they'll already be activated. For the scale switch, I added support for Rabbit Magic Man's 330x scale, or Titan scaling. As the name implies, this scale goes all the way up to the maximum scale possible, which is 32,767%. It's quite large. Finally, it's worth noting that I changed some switches to persist between rounds, which includes bro spawning, invincibility, and naturally, the switch that determines if scripts will automatically start. A side effect of this, unfortunately, is that theater clips will break if these switches are used. Apparently, theater doesn't save player stats, and so it doesn't know what to do when a game type tries to use them, and it crashes. As for new features in this update, the biggest new feature is the appearance of two labels, switch and switch gate. As expected, Switch turns the object into a Switch, meaning that if it's destroyed, it will activate the corresponding Switch Gate. This mainly works with explosives, so landmines, fusion coils, and so on. It will work with any object that's been deleted after it's been destroyed, so things like vehicles generally do not work because the vehicle body remains after it's been destroyed. Switches are linked to Switch Gates through the same spawn sequence. Switches with a negative spawn sequence will have the waypoint associated with them have a range. This range ranges from 1 block, with spawn sequences negative 1 to 5, all the way up to 20 blocks, with spawn sequences negative 95 to negative 100. As you can see, the ranges work in ranges of 5 spawn sequences. Switch gates are pretty simple, and work based on what team they're on. For neutral team, the object gets deleted. For red team, the object explodes and gets deleted. For blue team, the object disappears, but will reappear if the switch is hit again. For green team, the object will appear. And for orange team, the object will appear, but will disappear if the switch is hit again. Now, when in forge mode, the objects don't actually disappear or appear. Instead, they're attached to hill markers. And in order to replicate the visual of disappearing, I also scale them down. The bombs do explode though, so watch out for that. Now, normally in Forge, switch gates are inactive to make them easier to forge with. However, if you use the Gate Linger Toolbar switch, you can turn all switch gates on, at least the ones that are currently spawned in, and they'll function as expected. Do keep in mind that Neutral Team and Red Team actually delete the object even in Forge and if it doesn't have a respawn timer set, it will not respawn. Now, in order to assist with map object forging, I repurposed object by index and forge into a thing called object reference. Basically, this will do what object by index does, teleporting the map object to your base object, but it leaves a marker at the map object's original position with its orientation, so you know exactly where it is and where to put your object teleport sender node. Additionally, I've included a new feature for the spawner label, and that's being able to control animation devices. Now, I could explain what an animation device is, but instead, I'll just show you. As you can see, animation devices are special objects that play animations when activated. Using the spawner label with spawn sequence negative 50 or below, in case the object inside a zone, and when a player enters the zone, the object is activated. This behavior can be modified if you use an object with spawner plus 50 or above, the same absolute spawn sequence. Doing this will disable the zone and make it so that, when the object is destroyed, it behaves like a switch and turns the animation device on. Then, when hit again, it turns it off. Additionally, if you set the zone object with the negative spawn sequence to the red team, it will default the animation device to its active state, which effectively inverses the actions done to it. So, stepping in the zone, 
or hitting the switch the first time will actually deactivate the device. And aside from some smaller additions and changes that aren't really worth mentioning here, that's about it for changes in 1.1. Thank you all for watching this section of the video, and now I'm going to go into a full tutorial on every feature of Anvil Editor, which includes the updates I just mentioned. Anvil Editor is a mod package of game type mods, and as such, each mod is compatible with the custom games browser and with Xbox players, and Xbox players can host and play the mods as they please. Each game type contains the exact same modded features, so that there's cross compatibility between what you forge and what game types you play. With that said, the mod's features can be divided into two, with common features that are common between the game types and forge and forge specific features, which are necessary for an easy forging experience. To use the common features of the mod, you need an object, and you need to edit the object's properties. There's three properties we're concerned with. The game type label, the spawn sequence of the object, and the team of the object. What the spawn sequence and team of the object will do will depend on what the game type label is, and as such, I'll go through each label. For the spawner label, Positive spawn sequences will spawn various objects, depending on what the spawn sequence is. Spawn sequences 1 through 6 will spawn various objective items, shown in order here. Sequences 7 and 8 will spawn a Spartan and Elite biped respectively, which are used as dummy bipeds for things like checking sight lines or checking scale or what have you. Sequence 9 will spawn the Fire Particle Emitter object, which is fire. It doesn't do any damage on its own, and it's basically just scenery. Sequences 10 and 11 will spawn Pelican and Phantom Scenery objects, but with the turrets included. The Pelican turret is usable, as well as the Phantom side turrets, although the Phantom's main turret is not usable. Sequences 12, 13, and 14 will spawn detached Warthog turrets. Since the Ghost turret by default has strange physics, setting the team to blue team will also give it a proper base and allow it to turn normally. Spawn sequences 15 and 16 spawn Scorpion and Wraith anti-infantry turrets, which can't turn and can be pushed around. Spawn sequence 17 spawns an anti-air shade turret. Sequences 18 and 19 will spawn the left and right Falcon turret grenade launcher variants. Spawn sequence 20 spawns a phantom vehicle on Forge World which automatically attaches to the base object, so it doesn't fall through the map and explode. Spawn Sequence 21 spawns a phantom on Boneyard and Breakpoint. This is merely a scenery phantom, however. Spawn Sequence 22 spawns the Longsword animation device on Boneyard, while Spawn Sequence 23 spawns the UNSC Data Core Holder on Boneyard. Spawn Sequence 24 spawns the Core Holder on Spire, while Spawn Sequence 25 spawns a Pelican on Spire. Spawn Sequences 26 through 34 will spawn various lights. What lights will spawn will depend on what map, since not every map contains every light. Finally, Spawn Sequence 35 spawns a grid. On the negative side, Spawn Sequence negative 2 spawns a deletion zone. Spawn sequences negative 3 and negative 4 activate the scenario interpolator states, depending on what team they're on. These various states have different effects depending on what map they're used on. You can go into forge mode and turn on or turn off any state you desire, so you can see what effect it has. Spawn sequences negative 6 and negative 7 activate the civilian label features, as seen in Mythic Slayer. 
sequence negative 6 will delete any vehicle attachments that have weapons, while negative 7 will simply disable the weapons themselves. Spawn sequence negative 8 will create an invincibility zone that will make any object inside of it invincible. Conversely, spawn sequence negative 9 makes a invincibility zone, which will make any object inside of it become vulnerable again. Finally, spawn sequences negative 49 and below deal with animation devices. Spawn sequence negative 49 will set the device power to 100. This is useful for a specific animation device on Boneyard, which is any door that looks like this. Any spawn sequence below negative 49 will activate the animation device when the player enters its zone. The animation device also needs to be inside this object's zone. However, if there is an object with the same absolute spawn sequence on the positive side, then, upon the destruction of that object, the animation device will activate and hitting it again will deactivate it. Additionally, if you set the zone object, that is the zone with the spawn sequence of negative 50 or below, to the red team, the animation device will default to its active state, and when activated, it will actually deactivate. This can be useful for certain devices, such as this gate on breakpoint, which defaults to its open state, and when you go through it, it actually closes so you can invert the gate and have it open properly. The scale label is pretty straightforward to use. With the spawn sequences, changing the spawn sequence will change the scale of the object. The Anvil game types use the 47x scaling, which means that at spawn sequence negative 11, you'll be roughly 47 times scale with the object. Spawn sequence negative 10 is also the lowest number, with a scale of 1. Note that this scaling is only visual, and the actual collision of the object does not change with its scale. With that said, projectiles do properly collide with the scaled up object, or scaled down object for that matter. Scale also has a special use case with hill markers. Putting scale on a hill marker will turn the hill marker into a scale zone meaning that any object inside the zone is scaled to the same scale as the hill marker. Scale also has a couple of options depending on the team of the object. Setting the object to green team will activate shadow caster with the scale object, meaning that the object will become attached to a heavy barrier or a monitor if a heavy barrier is not available, and thus be able to cast its own shadow. The scale object loses collision altogether when doing this, however, since it's attached to another object. Another option comes for any other object, besides those with the scale label, if you set it to yellow team. Setting the object to yellow team will make it unaffected by any scale zones. Finally, a scale zone set to the yellow or pink teams will have an alternative form of scaling applied to it, where 1 is 100% scale, 100 is 100% scale, and negative 100 is 200% scale. Additionally, setting the scale zone object to brown or pink team will make it so that any object that enters the zone will only be scaled once. This prevents any sort of quicksand physics that can result from using the scale zone, but it also means that the object will no longer be affected by any other scale zones. Note that this does not happen in Forge, just in custom games. The switch and switch gate labels work similarly to the ones seen in Mythic Slayer. When the switch is destroyed, the switch gate is activated. If the gate is on neutral team, then the object is deleted. If the gate is on red team, then the object and gets deleted. If it's on blue team, the object disappears, but will reappear if the switch is hit again. Switch gates for green and orange team are disappeared by default but if the switch is hit, they will appear, and for orange team, they will disappear if the switch is hit again. Do keep in mind that objects that get deleted can respawn naturally if they have a respawn time, and if not, they simply won't respawn at all. Objects on the blue or orange team are not deleted, they're simply made invisible. Switches and switch gates are linked through the same spawn sequence, 
so you can have multiple gates on different teams doing different things. For the switch label itself, a negative spawn sequence will give it a limited range with its waypoint, depending on what the spawn sequence is. The bro spawn location label works exactly as it does in other game types. Object teleport is a very special label that allows you to forge with map objects. Object teleport functions using two objects, a sender node and a receiver node. A spawn sequence of less than zero is a sender node, and if you encase the map object inside of its zone, it will teleport it to the receiver node with the same absolute positive spawn sequence. By default, the map object is then attached to the receiver node, but it can be detached by setting the receiver node to red team. You can also turn the map object into a shadow caster by setting the receiver node to green team. Although inactive in Forge, object teleport sender nodes are always active in custom games. They don't teleport players, but they can teleport dropped weapons, objective items, or other objects that happen to get into their zone, so be careful of that. Also, setting the sender node to pink team will make the map object invincible. Mind you that this only works in custom games, and not in Forge. And finally, a spawn sequence of zero will attach the skybox directly to the object teleport object. No sender or receiver required. It does have the option to detach with red team, but no option for a shadow caster. Not that it works as you expect it to anyway. I should also point out that each game type has a couple of options for bro spawning and for making players invincible. We now move on to the Forge tool itself, and there's a lot to talk about here. To access the Forge tool, go into Forge, and select the SVE Anvil Editor under the Forge category in the game types. This game type alone has the modded features in Forge. The other Anvil game types do not have them, but you still need them in order to access their game type specific labels, such as Safe Havens for Infection, Assault Bomb for Assault, and so on. With the Anvil Editor Forge game type itself, when you start the game, the scripts should go off automatically. An easy way to tell is by the sound of VIP, new VIP, playing at the start of the round. On a few maps such as Solitary, Penance, and Sword Base, scripts do not start automatically, and you must destroy a machine gun turret in order to start scripts. When scripts are enabled, you can stop scripts by destroying a plasma cannon. The Forge mode has a few quality of life improvements. First of all, you instantly respawn, and when bro spawning, you respawn very quickly. Also, bro spawning without a location set will default the camera to an initial loadout camera. You also have team-based species, allowing you to easily switch between Spartan and Elite bipeds. The brown and pink teams are also permanent invincible teams meaning that any players on those teams are invincible at all times, even when hitting the invincibility switch. Any object set to the pink team is also made invincible. Finally, when scrolling through the forge labels, spawn sequence zero will always do nothing, so you can't accidentally trigger any features. The game type labels have some forge specific features, which I'll go over right now. For the spawner label, spawn sequence negative 1 will create a distance check on the object, checking the distance from the object to the host player, or the player on the same team of the object if it's not on neutral team. Sequence negative 5 will do an object count for every object on the map. This does not filter for specifically forge objects, but it is a good rough counter for how close you are to the 650 forge object limit. Sequence negative 10 will highlight every animation device on a map with a waypoint over it. 
Sequence negative 11 will make every kill boundary and soft kill boundary shape visible. For the scale label, setting the object to yellow team will return it to normal scale. This only happens in Forge, and in custom games, it will be scaled as usual. For the attach base and attachment labels, by default, they aren't actually activated, meaning you can freely alter the spawn sequence of an attach base or attachment object without accidentally attaching an attachment to something else. You can momentarily activate the attach base and attachment labels by using a toolbar switch. For the switch gate label, objects that are set to disappear will actually just be scaled down to 1% and attached to a hill marker. Objects that are set to be deleted will actually be deleted, however. By default, however, the gates are not in this state, and they have to be set as so by using the gate blinker label, which will set them up to be used in Forge. Normally, they can't be used for ease of forging purposes. The toolbar label label is only used internally and doesn't actually do anything in Forge. The bro spawn location label will work for all players when bro spawning is enabled, regardless of what team it's on, but only in Forge. The object teleport label is disabled completely by default, but it can be turned on if the sender node is set to purple team, or if the map object teleport toolbar switch is hit. You can also give the skybox a shadow caster, but this doesn't happen in custom games, just in Forge. Object reference is a Forge only feature that works very similarly to how object by index did. Using the spawn sequences, you can scroll through and see different objects, and a hill marker with a waypoint will show its original location and orientation. With this information, you can easily use an object teleport sender node and place it in the correct position for the map object. I need to emphasize that object reference cannot be used on its own to forge map objects. It's simply a way to see what map objects are available. Next, we have what I'd see as the standout feature of Anvil Editor, the Toolbar Mode. Toolbar Mode gives you access to a number of switches for convenience and for better control over the mod scripts. Toolbar Mode is divided into three sections. There's one section for player options, one section for object options, and a starting section that can be used to reach both the player and object options, but it also has a couple options of its own. The tool switch disables toolbar mode, and you can enable it by changing teams. The auto script switch turns off automatically starting scripts when the round begins. Of course, this only works on maps where auto starting scripts can be achieved in the first place. Under the player section, you have options for enabling bro spawning for all players, suicide, making yourself invincible, and the race feature that puts all players in a mongoose once they go into player mode. Naturally, hitting the respective switch again will toggle it off. Under the object options, you have the option to toggle scale on or off, or change the type of scaling used. The available options are Anvil Zone 47x, the Legacy 33x scaling, Rabbids 71x scaling, or Rabbids Titan scaling which goes up to 330 times scale. The attach trigger will cause the attach base and attachment labels to go off, meaning that any currently spawned attachments will be attached to their respective bases. Similarly, the map obj trigger will cause any object teleport sender nodes to teleport their objects to the receiver nodes. With both of these triggers, the respective actions only happen once. So if you have more attachments to attach later, or more map objects to teleport, you'll need to hit the triggers again. The gate linker toolbar switch will set switch gate objects to their default state and allow them to be used in tandem with switches. Normally, you can't do this for ease of forging purposes, and some default states make the object unforgeable. Finally, the shadow switch will disable shadows from shadow casters and allow you to forge the objects again. And that's everything for Anvil Editor 1.1. Like I said at the beginning, this is going to be the last update for the mod, and I'm going to focus on much smaller and much easier to handle projects from now on. Thank you all for the continued support and interest in the mod, 
throughout its production and updates, and I hope to see you all again on whatever crazy project I upload next.